Welcome to this uh, FIRMA Risk Management Seminar Workshop, where today we're going to focus on technology exposure and in the new world. My name is Julia Graham. I'm Deputy CEO of AIRNIC. I've got a background in international insurance, enterprise risk management and compliance within uh, an international company insurance company and a global law firm. I'm a board member of IFRIMA, but very importantly, especially today, a past president of FIRMA, and I'm delighted to be your moderator. I'm very pleased to introduce our panel, who you will see uh, up on the screen. Uh, first of all, I will start off with Philippe Cotel, who is the head of insurance and risk management of Airbus Defence and Space a role that he's held since 2014 and which includes all Airbus activities in space, defence and military transport aviation. Prior to this, Philippe was in charge of insurance risk management for the space activities of Airbus and the largest UK MOD PFI contract and the first for the space industry. Philippe is a board member of FIRMA and a member of the French association AMRE. I'd then like to introduce Chanil Williams. Chanil is Global Head of Financial Lines at AGS, a role that he's held since 2016, when he was appointed a country manager prior to that for New Zealand. In 2018, he relocated to Munich as Global Head of Commercial for Financial Lines. And prior to joining Allianz, he spent 14 years with AIG, and held a number of increasingly senior financial lines, regional and leadership roles in Auckland, Johannesburg, Paris and London. And then uh, last but definitely by no means least, I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Saunders. Dr. Jamie Saunders is a visiting professor at University College London. The majority of his career has been spent in UK government, including GCHQ, the Cabinet Office, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the National Crime Agency, in which his roles included director of the National Cyber Crime Unit, where he helped to build up new operational partnerships with international allies and with business. He now provides advice on cyber governance and security to government and to business. Uh, welcome to all of the panel. Um, I'd like to make a, a few introductory words and I'd like to start with a couple of slides taken from the uh, risk management report produced by uh, FIRMA. Um, if you take a look at the slide that's in front of you, um, this will uh, take you through some of the implications for cyber resilience challenges in the next world. And I would like to share with you um, the uh, findings from the report that looks at innovative risk management practice um, and how they are continuing to develop. So we're, we're not at the end of a journey, but most definitely innovative practices have come on in the last few years and continue to develop. And another slide taken from the European Risk Manager Report 2020 looks at the contribution uh, risk management makes to the digital transformation of organizations. And then finally, I'd like to uh, share with you a slide from a report published by McKinsey last week. Now, this also helps to set uh, a very interesting context about how digitization has been influenced by COVID-19. Just look at the numbers of how digitization has moved forward uh, for things that are associated with products and services that are partially or fully digitized between seven or six and more than 10 years in the space of months. So this is uh, an incredibly uh, interesting scene setter for what we're going to talk about today, because in today's connected environment, cybersecurity is a constant concern but rapidly evolving in terms of cyber threats and particularly those related to COVID-19, which have required organizations to strengthen their IT security defenses. 
The pandemic has also focused attention on the concentration of risk in terms of location and for many, their supply chain and suppliers. Welcome to the new world and the implications for cyber resilience. Today with our fabulous panel, we will use a mix of presentations, polls and a Q&A session to consider the following. Cyber risk and cyber supply chain as an enterprise risk, the dynamic nature of cyber risk, the implications of artificial intelligence, the role for the risk management professional in this new world, and the role of insurers in shaping new world cyber resilience. Now, that's a very long agenda, but I have every confidence in our marvelous panel, um, who I'm now going to hand over to, and I'm going to ask uh, Philippe Cotel, to take us forward, Philippe, with your initial thoughts uh, on the subject for today. Philippe, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, for your kind words. And uh, um, uh, welcome to, to everyone. Um, I would like maybe to, to just reinforce the message given by Julia with some very uh, spectacular, spectacular numbers that are coming out of this COVID-19 crisis and the impact on digitalization. I mean, this crisis has been massive and uh, the, the companies have reacted very quickly in order to try to preserve as much as they can their activity in, in a form which is as agile as possible. And effectively, we've, we've seen a booming in teleworking uh, in, during the, 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 the largest part of the, of the crisis. We end up with 25% of active workforce in France practicing teleworking, which is absolutely unprecedented. As interestingly, the telemedicine topic has increased dramatically with 28% of usage for two reasons. Of course, people were probably anxious about their health and willing to get some, some advice from, from their doctor, but on the same time, they were also anxious to go to the doctor and, uh, and f facing the, the risk of having uh, uh, some contamination from, uh, from other uh, people. So effectively, you can understand the need both of teleworking to, to increase, uh, I mean, to, to be able to, to, to do some work and on the telemedicine because of, of this health issue. But what is also very interesting is that you all know the value of medical data and uh, the, the increase, the sharp increase of telemedicine usage is also indicative of the use of, of medical data, which is significantly higher. Two other elements which are, are also quite interesting to notice. First, the, 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 the booming on e-business, and that's quite obvious. Um, everybody has, has seen the, the, the amazing increase of, of sales of Amazon, but it's, it's, uh, it's more general uh, comment that uh, online sales overall have increased by 40%, which is uh, has, which has no equivalent. And by the same way, e-payment, digital payment have increased by 50%, which is spectacular. And also is using this, uh, this contactless form of payment, which is probably uh, promoted as well. So you have a combination of different factors and all of them are leading to a, a significant increase of digitalization. It, it's really not something progressive. It's really a quantum leap, if I may say so, which was uh, probably not expected nor anticipated. Which comes to my next slide, which is the fact that, yes, it was a crisis. And uh, as a matter of resilience, the companies had to, to, uh, to, to react in, in, this, in this difficult time and to provide the best answer as possible. But uh, to do that, some of companies, and probably most of them, had to do some compromise between security, which was mandatory, and agility. Agility in order to uh, deploy the, the, the infrastructure necessary to support this digitalization for, for their, their workers and uh, to develop a new facility for, for the development of e-business. As a result of that, as a result of this compromise, you created some blurred frontier between what was a private use 
and the professional use. So sometimes you see the teleworkers had used had to use their private computers or so bring your own device in order to to be able to to uh, continue to work. And that massive surface of an increased surface of surface of attack has a, a number of consequences. The consequence did not appear immediately, I would say, during the crisis. But it's probably interesting to see that we were concerned and we were right when uh, the, the, all the different teleworkers would reintegrate the, the network of the company after some weeks of, of working remotely without all the, the online support. So, uh, and we have seen, without any surprise, a huge, uh, that was used, a huge opportunity for a malicious attack. And uh, we've seen a sharp increase, for example, plus 600% increase in phishing, which has been noticed uh, across the different companies. Um, the critical infrastructure have been also impacted severely, plus 100% support request on critical infrastructure. For example, in France, we have ANSI, which is the, the, the uh, French security agency, who is really uh, specialized in this critical infrastructure support, who explained that by uh, September, we had already twice more support requests than the full year before, which is of no surprise. The SMEs also have requested a, a significant uh, support request, and they were effectively affected significantly by ransomware uh, and ransomware attack. But we see also a new number of new forms of, of attacks. And uh, for example, we see DDoS ransomware. And it's a combination of, of attack which try to, to uh, clearly paralyze, uh, completely block the system and uh, support that we request for ransom but also big game hunting. So it's the contrary. Instead of having this vast, massive ransomware wave, it's more a dedicated attack, which is um, um, targeting a specific uh, company, a specific target. We, we also, we heard again, I heard this morning at the radio that uh, there were a number of attacks at the moment uh, to the pharmaceutical labs who are currently trying to find the, 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 the the vaccine for for the coronavirus uh, issue, and uh, it's uh, it's really the trend that we see at the moment. Having said that, how do we we respond to this point, this situation? There are two consequences of this crisis. First of all, the digitization of the economy has raised significantly. Every company now as is more dependent on cyber than before. In other words, if there was a cyber disruption, the economic impact of this disruption to the company would be more expensive than before because they are more relying today in their business on digital. The second aspect is that there is also the environment of threats that have uh, increased significantly meaning that uh, the probability to be hacked or to suffer an attack has raised dramatically compared to before. So you have a combination of both. You have a, a bigger financial exposure in a, an environment which is uh, more threatening. In that environment, clearly you need to have a, a, the necessity of awareness of that situation and also to deploy risk management as a mandatory tool to support your activity and your business. There is absolutely no way out. It's a mandatory activity which needs to be deployed in each company, in each uh, organization right now. Um, in, in this slide, you see the, the document that we produced uh, with the support of, of ANSI, the French Security Agency, where together we try to propose a clear process to deploy a, a, a true risk management approach for digital risk. And we can only promote that now because more than ever, it is necessary to deploy that. 
But cyber insurance has to be part of the risk management framework as well. So it's not, you need to have a clear awareness of the issue on, on your side. You need to deploy risk management uh, process to address that internally, to make sure that you have the, the right resource, the right budget, to make sure that uh, the cybersecurity measures will be applied. It's interesting to, to, to have in mind that 70% uh, of the attacks, the, the, the general ones, can be overcome with the limited amount of cybersecurity sub, sub, um, budget. On the end, we know that it's a challenging time for demanding increased budget. So it's really important to combine this awareness with a clear a message that this is really uh, uh, the future of your company, which is at stake. But then insurance has a role to play in this framework. And uh, the quality of the dialogue between insured and insurer should be a top priority. Of course, if you, if you have um, a scope where the claims can be more expensive and the likelihood of having a claim has increased, then of course it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, context to convince insurers to come into play. But if you are able to provide the right dialogue and to explain to your insurer really all the actions and the steps you have put together in order to deploy a true risk management process within your company, that's really the, the way to, to handle that discussion. On the end, on the insurer side, and we, we are privileged to have a channel uh, who will be able to explain that a bit further. Insurance needs to stand firm and to be real partners in this situation, avoiding to, to let the, the business alone facing this risk. Because no question, there is no turning back on digitalization. The step that we have seen during the crisis will stay. Teleworking will continue to be in place, maybe not at the level we have seen during the crisis, but will remain anyway. There will be probably also uh, different ways of working, new de business development, new habits has also been using adopting digital business more broadly than before. So clearly there is no turning back on digitalization. Therefore, the risk is there and insurers have to play a role there. And they cannot ignore that this is really what is needed by the insured and by the economy overall. And to some extent, public authority shall involve themselves to support this economy because we cannot uh, afford to have another pandemic, a cyber pandemic, where if the insurers have not really played their part of this process, a number of companies would be left alone and facing this financial impact without any, any sort of solution. We need collectively to be aware to deploy a, a true risk management process with the right support and with the right effort with the insurers to be able to have at every stage of the stake, uh, every stakeholders needs to take part of that game and public authority also, also needs to, to be supporting this global uh, movement. So, so that's how I, I would try to paint the, the new situation that we see today regarding uh, the consequence of COVID-19. So I think so, so, a, a question. Yes, I think you'll now go forward with a poll, is that right? Yeah. So what should the insurance industry support? One is reinsure and insure standardized cyber wordings. Two, minimum cyber security standards. Three, standalone cyber insurance. Four, cyber exposure covered by existing traditional insurance, but removal of silent cover. Or five, premium discount from premium rates for evidence of good risk management.
So. <lacht> um, so if I see we have a, a quite a even level of answer. So um, uh, more or less there is no obvious answer to the question. I, I would be tempted to, to there is uh, still the majority for a standardized cyber wordings. I think I can understand that, and I understand that there is probably concern that um, um, cyber uh, coverage may be different from one insurer to the other, and that could result in sort of uh, uncertainty regarding the, the quality of coverage. There are two, two elements on that. First, it is a fact, and I've done many conferences with uh, IT specialists, there is a, still some skepticism regarding IT specialists or, about the capacity of cyber insurance to step in at the time of the crisis. Um, my experience regarding the, uh, the feedback from my peers who had suffered some, some claims that every of them are convinced, uh, the IT people, that uh, once a claim comes in, insurance can play a role and be efficient. So for me, probably more than, than having this, uh, this, this concern on cyber wording, I think really what is for me the biggest challenge is to keep cyber exposure covered. And um, the point is that we have seen a trend, not by all insurers, but a trend anyway, by some insurers to uh, maybe reduce their participation to, uh, to some, some support on, on some, some coverage. Um, there was a, a situation in the past where silent cover was gr granted as part of traditional insurance and therefore we are not intended to do that. And clearly clarification was necessary. But some insurers have understood clarification as just exclusions. And as I mentioned, it's uh, understanding, uh, this understanding, this common understanding of coverage is mandatory. But we shall find solutions where there is always a possibility to cover the true risk facing by the business. And uh, the fact that the, the, the business has now a more dependency on digital has just increased the need to, to have true solutions provided by insurance to address cyber exposure. And that's for me probably the the, the critical element uh, going forward in the future. Okay, so Philippe, um, I think we are now ready to move on. Earlier, thank you. Hi everyone, Shana Williams here. Uh, actually, Philippe, and now over to Chanel. So I just to uh, transition from. Philippe's session there. I'm going to continue to look through the cyber risk exposure with the lens of, of COVID-19 and where we sit at the moment, but bring perhaps a slightly more insurer perspective to some of those challenges that uh, Philippe spoke about. So I will um, talk through a couple of slides, a little bit less uh, statistic driven. I think Philippe covered that very well and a little bit more challenging to us as an industry is some of the things we might need to do as we look ahead. So I think, you know, cyber and tech, you know, we've talked a long time about it being the emerging risk. I think it's clear now it is the risk uh, that will face us for the future. And of course, this has been exacerbated by COVID-19. And I think if you if you think about not just cyber insurance on its own, if you think about how cars will crash in the future, how um, Aviation claims might happen, uh, fire, a lot is going to be related to technology. And I think you can see there on the bottom the the swan, and we, we have a black swan at the moment, but there will be more black swans. Technology is now permeating every risk. Uh, and if you look at your balance sheets, many of you, of course, your balance sheets and your liabilities have, have shifted significantly from traditional physical Type risks uh, and liabilities to more intangible, and technology is a big part of that. COVID-19 is a huge wake-up for myself as an insurer, but I think also for clients 
for brokers, for all risk professionals to start thinking about what the next one could be. And I think we have to be very honest with ourselves that in terms of a global event, particularly with a non-damage business interruption type impact across multiple companies, cyber must be at the top uh, of that list. And therefore, I think we have to go from being very reactive as we have uh, through the pandemic on, on the exposure and the financial impact to being a lot bigger picture thinking and, and proactive to make sure that if that is the next swan, cyber swan, if I can call it that, that we have prepared as an industry to help mitigate such an event as much as possible. Of course, it's also multi-dimensional. There's the personal data element, which affects us in our homes, with our families. There's obviously the commercial implications with business interruption uh, and impact to companies. And of course, you will have seen lately geopolitical with things like TikTok, uh, WeChat, Huawei, and supply chain and trade globally now also having a huge focus on on how technology plays into that. So what you, what do we need to do? Uh, I will put out probably more questions than answers, but I hope they're provocative enough to get some of us to rally together as an industry and, and hopefully come up with some things that can be forward looking. I think obviously the risk quantification is a big part and to build on what Philippe said, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for the insurance industry and insurers to reflect those clients that take security seriously and improve security seriously by giving them appropriate terms, whether that's premium, whether that's capacity, and therefore giving that nice incentive to all companies to improve their IT security. And obviously the, the flip side of that is, is a well-functioning insurance market. I think tightening that that I triangle, so ourselves as insurers, as you as clients, and also the brokers, that we we can't do this in isolation in terms of adequate cover um, and managing the aggregation risks, which I'll speak about, which is what our biggest concern is. We must work more closely together and not in isolation. And I think we can all admit, we're at a, I think we're at a, a very interesting tipping point now with cyber insurance where we've had you know a lot of excitement, a lot of growth, and now we, in terms of the supply and the demand curves, we're actually at an interesting intersection where, as Philippe said, there is some hesitation uh, for at least increased capacity. Sometimes there's a propensity to decrease. Uh, but at the same time, we are, we are experiencing significantly more claims and exposure. An example for us is definitely the ransomware uh, area where we have been looking at around about 70 million euros of ransomware related cyber insurance claims this year and of course with COVID uh, accelerating that. I think we're at a very interesting dynamic to make sure that this this insurance market that we've created through cyber, which I think potentially for all of us is the biggest new growth opportunity uh, on the broker and insurer side that we don't um, yeah, we don't, if I can say it, screw it up before we even get started. So I think that we really need to think big of what's ahead of us. So on the next slide, you know, things we can do, you know, we have a very static risk assessment process. We get proposal forms from you as clients. We assess the risk at a point in time. And I think one thing to think about is how do we incentivize behavior, which on cyber risk has to be not an annual um, hygiene exercise or investment exercise, it's a constant exercise. So how, how as a market can we react to the risk uh, improving or deteriorating more on a, on a live basis? There's other examples in insurance, uh, for example, trade credit, where you do have that model which is a little bit more dynamic in, in risk assessment. Open ecosystems, and I think you know there there are challenges here with antitrust and sharing of information. But I think the more we all understand about for you as peers, best practice on risk management for us as insurers, claims experience, exposure data, uh, brokers on coverage. I think it can only improve the resilience of of the industry. I think we touched on wordings before. I think. My view on that is not necessarily we need to see the exact same insurance cover everywhere, but I think on certain elements, we need that clarification. Silent cyber, affirmative cyber is, is one topic. 
I think the the war on terrorism topic is another topic that are, is out there that there are industry groups looking at that, and obviously ransomware, which is, as Philippe mentioned, one of the major drivers of of claims. The big the big elephant in the room for insurers is the cat exposure. We when we think of cat, we normally think of of property and an earthquake in California. But of course, what what if we have a global virus, cyber virus, a global ransomware attack that is multiple country, multiple insurers? This is something as insurers we are we're spending a lot of time on modeling. It's a concern obviously for us, it's a concern for our regulators. And as Philippe said, it will be a concern if there is such a big event that we as an industry, and that might even be public private partnership, have uh, produced a, a solution for risk transfer uh, that will be able to mitigate potentially the harmful events there. So again, on that data sharing is, is important so we can model some of that data. There's been some great studies that really highlight this issue. One was a Lloyd study that looked at a global ransomware event and modeled the impact around about 190 billion, which is 20 billion more than Hurricane Katrina. So this, again, no excuse here for the industry, but this is something I think we all need to speak openly about on how we how we look at data, how we can model aggregation to make sure that as insurers we can give sustainable solutions uh, for this market as it is a very important risk that none of us can ignore. I think the mitigation part as well, the way we people mitigate cyber events or technology related events and respond to those events uh, are very important. We've seen that companies that respond quickly, they stabilize their share price if they're listed, they stabilize their reputation quickly. So I think the importance of thinking about cyber insurance not as just a indemnity or business interruption product, but as a as a service solution that can help get ahead of the risk rather than reacting to that. So again, I, yes, absolutely. I for me, I think one of the biggest commercial risks we have a growing risk highlighted by COVID again as a as a risk that you as clients will demand more solutions for to to transfer and, and manage that risk. And I think the time is now that as an industry, you know, we, we can be more open to help understand each other's challenges on, on the table, whether it's the journey for you as a client in terms of risk management best practice, or it's some of our challenges on risk. So similar to uh, Philippe, I will go to a poll question. And I know we did have a couple of people commenting it went off uh, quickly the last one, so hopefully this one uh, stays up a little bit longer. So you will see this coming up on your screen soon, and at the, the question related to my uh, panel session is, which is the most important area cyber insurers need to improve the most? Capacity, uh, number one, Philippe already mentioned that. Wordings, coverage, number two. Number three, limits and deductibles. Number four, the claims handling process. Number five, the value added services. So that can be legal, crisis management, public relations. So I'll let you impute your votes there and we will have the results up on the screen shortly. Hopefully you can see the result there. We have two, uh, number one and two, the capacity and the wordings standing out ahead. I will certainly take that feedback as part of my improvement on our offering here at, at AGCS. And also then as in a bronze medal position, we have the value added services and we can see actually some questions coming through around that that we might be able to address later. With that, I will hand over to our next panelist, uh, Jamie. Um, well, I'm going to focus uh, my remarks on how technology and technology risk is going to evolve 
over the next few years. And the key message uh, from my remarks is that you as risk managers need to maintain a forward look on technology and how it might impact on your business. But I'm going to start with a polling question um, because this is all about corporate governance. So the question I have for you is, what's the most important for cyber risk management governance? Is it appointing a cyber literate non-executive director? Um, is it something for the whole board to consider? Should it be led by the Cyber Risk Committee uh, appointed by the board? Or should there be um, uh, uh, something that's delegated down to the C-suite? So to what extent is this a board issue and who in the board should have the greatest responsibility? And those results are just coming in now. So I hope you can see the results there um, with a balance between this being the whole board responsibility and a C-suite, something that should be delegated to the C-suite um, let's explore that maybe a bit further in the Q&A session. Now, as I said, I want to focus on future technology. And of course, we can all see how technology has evolved in the last 10, 20 years and how our reliance on it has increased. And Philippe and Chanel have both spoken about that. And clearly, COVID-19 has accelerated that dependence. But we're actually now well into the next phase of technology transformation. And that's building on things like big data and artificial intelligence, on ubiquitous high-speed connectivity between devices, and an emerging digital management uh, ecosystem. And all of this is to allow more economic and social transactions to take place online. Over the horizon, uh, we have quantum computing, uh, which will, when it happens, fundamentally uh, transform the ability for us to solve certain computational problems which are completely untractable uh, with today's uh, technology. So there's lots and lots for the technical community to do and the technology security community to do to address those uh, challenges and to make those new technologies as secure as possible. But the key question today is what role do senior leaders, what role do boards and what role in particular do risk managers have in preparing organisations for the risks and opportunities that arise from these challenges? <clears throat> and the key point, the next key point, is that these changes in the underlying technology are and will continue to drive significant changes in business process and therefore business risk. Over the past 12 months, I've been involved in some work with Oxford University and the World Economic Forum, looking at these emerging technologies, how they'll change our business process and business risk, and indeed what role business leaders should, should play individually and collectively to prepare for this new era. The final report from Oxford University and the World Economic Forum um, is coming out next month, but I did just want to pull out a few highlights uh, for you. So the first is that this ubiquitous connectivity, this high speed ubiquitous uh, connectivity that's available is leading to a deeper entanglement of business processes and a changing relationship between different players in the supply chain. And a good example of that is the increasing dependence on shared services such as cloud computing and 5G. And if your companies have been thinking about cloud computing, for example, over, over the recent years, 
I think you'll find that more and more companies are recognizing that they have to adopt this technology. The price advantages are just too great uh, to ignore. But some of the issues around uh, regulation, some of the issues about around uh, liability and contracts that evolved in earlier phases of technology aren't really able to cope with that level of entanglement that ubiquitous connectivity uh, will create. Um, I just want to share a particular concern, and this will come out in the report, um, that a lot of current processes both in terms of regulation, in terms of insurance, in terms of supply chain management, uh, in terms of uh, in investment and uh, uh, you know in investor decisions, they are based on a form of standards and compliance-based attestation questionnaires going around. Um, but this industry of asking attestation questions has created a huge amount of friction and overhead. It is acting as a barrier to uh, international trade and it's arguable whether it's actually providing uh, the security assurance that it's actually uh, designed to provide. So that's ubiquitous connectivity. On artificial intelligence, AI and big data raise enormous questions around accountability and liability and who's responsible for the algorithm. And we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of discussion about this in the public sphere around, for example, the issues of inherent bias uh, when AI is being used in healthcare, public protection, and in law enforcement. Similar issues are going to arise in terms of the commercial market and liability, insurability, etc., and who is accountable for algorithms. Uh, that work has yet to be done. And finally, on digital um, identity management, um, that is evolving extremely quickly. It, what's underpinning a lot of the economic transactions and the growth in digital uh, um, transactions that Philippe mentioned. The problem is that different approaches to identity management are evolving in different parts of the world. And that's exacerbating challenges we're already facing in terms of the fragmentation of the digital economy, um, that we're already seeing that in terms of pressure for data localization and an overall politicization of the internet that we've seen in things like the TikTok and Huawei debates, which we've already uh, discussed. Now, the final uh, WEF and University of Oxford report will be setting out a range of recommendations on how we tackle these challenges. And I wanted to uh, draw out two of those. The first is that individual business leaders supported by both their technology experts and their risk management experts need to have a forward look, need to understand what the impact of these changes are going to be on your own organizations. Because the way that these will impact is going to be unique to you. So you need to understand you, do, you don't want to be blindsided uh, by these emerging risks. Now, some challenges, uh, such as the impact of quantum computing, might seem a very, very well long way off, but only you can tell how your organization is exposed and how that exposure is going to evolve in time and what you have to do now to ensure you stay inside your risk tolerance thresholds. I should say that FIRMA uh, is very involved in this work and in particular, so I've, I'm missing a slide, here we are, um, FIRMA uh, have produced already a report looking at artificial intelligence. This was produced last year and Philippe uh, was one of the authors and that has a very useful checklist looking at the kinds of things you have to think about in terms of how AI is being deployed within your business, but also within your broader, within your business, but also within your broader sector. A checklist looking at how AI is being applied and what that means in terms of your potential uh, operational and strategic risk exposure. So as risk managers, you should be reading reports like this. You should be thinking of 
other emerging technologies and thinking through what does this mean for me as an organization. The second uh, recommendation is one for our community as a whole, and that's looking at what kind of collective action is going to be required by multiple organizations across sectors and across national boundaries to address some of the systemic risks associated with new technology. And Chanil uh, has touched on this. Uh, for me, a good uh, example of this is the way that different jurisdictions have approached data protection uh, and cybersecurity uh, standards and GDPR and all these sorts of things. Um, every country in the world recognizes the importance of personal uh, data and data protection. Um, but the problem is, is that we've had inconsistent approaches um, uh, arising in different parts of the world. And we have a lack of mutual recognition. This is something that the G20 in Osaka uh, last year uh, recognize that these inconsistent approaches that are emerging are actually creating a massive compliance industry, but also acting as barriers to international trade. And as I said before, not necessarily uh, creating the risk reduction that um, we're all after. The challenge is working out who is actually responsible for bringing some rationality to this to drive ideas forward such as mutual recognition, uh, common standards and so on. And that's something that the World Economic Forum will be focusing on when the report uh, comes out. So the bottom line uh, for us today is that there are some very significant transformations taking place in the underlying technology and ecosystem that supports our businesses that supports the global economy. Understanding exactly how these are going to impact on your business is something that only you can tell. And risk managers have an absolutely vital role to play in leading that work, understanding how technology is evolving, understanding how that's going to impact on your business and communicating that understanding to your board. And with that, I shall hand back to Julia. Thank you very much indeed, Jamie. So um, I hope everyone online agrees, and we've got a great turnout online, that we've had the subject for today addressed through three very complementary but different lenses from uh, the uh, insurance buyer and risk manager through to the insurer and through um, to an academic and research point of view presented by Jamie. So what we're going to do now is take a little bit of time out to pose a few questions um, to the panel um, to start uh, a discussion rolling. And then I'm going to turn to questions that are coming in from those who are online. And I can see some of those questions coming in. Uh, don't think we've forgotten you. I can see them there and we will allow time to address those questions. So if you still have a question that you would like to raise, don't be shy and send that through to us. But I'm going to start with a question that I think all of our three panelists could probably um, provide a, a point of view on. Um, and I'm going to uh, start uh, with posing this question, I think, to Philippe. And this question is, how can we ensure, you know, you've all talked about engagement of top leadership and how it's uh, so important uh, for top leaders in organizations to be engaged, but how can we ensure that top leadership are equipped to engage effectively in overseeing an organization's response to technology risk? You know, it's all very well to say that you should be responsible, but how do we help them deliver that responsibility? Um, Philippe, um, I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to turn to uh, Chanel, and then ask uh, Jamie to address the same question. Shall we let the poll continue to vote or? Because that, well, that poll was not for now, actually. I was going to be asking that later. So um, unfortunately, that's triggered a, a little bit sooner than I would have liked. Um, but yeah, just to, to answer, I mean, um, from my perspective, the risk manager should not be an expert in IT technology or 
an expert on cyber threats. I think if I if I try to 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 maximize, I mean to 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 make my message clear, the risk measure is at at the corner of different topics. Cyber risk management is the the, the meeting cyber threats on one side, vulnerability on the other side, and business. And basically, what we aim to identify is how a cyber threat can take benefit of a vulnerability which exists within uh, the system, but which is affecting the business. And basically, as a risk manager, you need to be able to discuss both with the business and understand what are the vulnerabilities of the business that are the most critical ones, not all of them, but the critical ones, and then discuss with IT specialists who are effectively the ones who have the best knowledge about our cyber threats and have a view about all the vulnerabilities that can affect the company. And therefore, the risk manager should be the man creating this dialogue, allowing to have a clear picture of what are really the, 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 the meeting the dots between a vulnerability which is really critical for the business, which can be affected by a cyber threat. And that's how you can really have this clear dialogue towards top management to, to provide not just a message which is a bit vague about we have a number of vulnerabilities and you need to invest everywhere, or there's a lot of uh, cyber threats and we see a ransomware just everywhere, which is a bit, which is correct, but which is not concrete. So if you have a concrete message, which is affecting the business impact of a cyber threat on a vulnerability and to present the way forward in order to address that in terms of resilience of the company, that's where the risk manager has a role to play and is the most credible. Neil, would you, would you like to uh, offer a point of view on that, please? Yes, thank you, Julie. I would, you know, for me, the, the cyber and technology risk is, is elevated now. So uh, we obviously also a DNO insurer, and I think the whole board topic and thinking about those vulnerabilities and the 360 impact they can have, whether it's reputation, share price, I think is an important message to pass up the chain. Another example, actually, just this morning, we were speaking to Allianz Global Investors, the way they look at ESG, and in particular, the G part of that, the governance part of that, and the cyber risk. This is a, also a fundamental concern for which companies they invest in or underwrite offering of security. So for me, I think, yeah, to add on Philippe's closing the gap, risk management and IT, then I think it's once that gap is is aligned, making sure the that board 360 view is also part of the process. Thank you, Chanel. Now, now, Jamie, um, a lot of what you were talking about um, earlier was was very much about um, top leadership. Um, but how do we get them involved and how do we get them equipped? Um, certainly in my past, I found Nobody wants to put their hand up in a board meeting and feel that they're looking a bit dumb or a bit stupid. So how can we give the board a confidence level to allow them to effectively engage and oversee what we want them to do? The, the first thing I'd say, Julia, I've done work with board level in the US and Europe and indeed in, in Middle East and Asia. And I find that boards in the United States are just much more at ease with talking about technology uh, than they are in other other regions. And I think there is a, a particular problem and maybe a particular problem in Europe that board members maybe have grown up, they, very few have grown up through a sort of technology uh, a technology uh, ladder. So I think there is a there is an issue there, um, which in a sense we have to resolve over time. Um, 
uh, and uh, by having that generation of board members who are who are comfortable with technology like like they do in the United States. Um, but while we're waiting for that, and I, and I'd agree with a lot that's been said uh, by Philippe and uh, Chanel, I mean, I think it's really important to make sure that cyber is properly embedded. Uh, in in enterprise risk management, and not just a kind of something that's dealt with separately by a, a CISO or a, a CIO who um, who turns up a, occasionally and says things that people don't understand. Um, I agree very strongly with Chanel that the risk exposures need to be expressed in business impact terms, and that could be through quantification. Uh, with uh, with the financial impacts, or that could be uh, with a conduct lens, looking at the kind of DNO uh, type angles, um, and then finally, and I think this doesn't happen enough, but boards are often presented with investment requirements on technology. But I think what's often not done is is that the the those technology investment plans aren't necessarily mapped onto what they mean in terms of risk reduction or indeed uh, risk uh, creation. So I think um, it's not just boards being more technically capable, but when they're looking at things like technology investment to make sure they're asking the right questions about what does this do in terms of our risk exposures uh, and cyber risk in general. I think that's beginning to happen. Um, but I don't think it's happening consistently. Um, and if there isn't the right expertise on the board, then it is, of course, worth looking at having some sort of external advisor um, who can guide the board and help them write, ask the right questions whenever cyber or new technology uh, is on the agenda. OK, Jamie, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take each of um, our panel in turn and ask them a question, and then I'm going to move on to a really nice bank of questions that are building up from uh, those of our delegates who are online today. So my next question sort of follows on from some of the theme about making people equipped. And I'm going to direct this one um, to Philippe. And um, Philippe, the question I'd like to ask you is, it's one thing to make the board ahead of the curve and up to speed. But what about the risk professional? And before you answer that, um, my eyesight is is uh, very quick, and I spotted that um, slightly in advance poll that we had about what do our members need um, for the future to help them manage uh, some of the scenarios we've been talking about today. And the top um, issue in that poll was relevant knowledge. So with that in mind, Philippe, how does the risk professional stay ahead of the cyber curve? What do they need to do? I think they need to realize that um, it's not the point of becoming a specialist in IT. So you don't need to be an IT specialist to manage your cyber risk as a risk manager. But you need to be able to have the right dialogue with every party, meaning that, I mean, it took us years, but um, through our work, we have been able to have a dialogue with the business in order to identify business risks. Overall, that's our job. That's what we do every day. So we have been able to, over time, to develop this common dialogue and the, the language understanding between us and the business to be able to translate into risks, the business issue that, uh, that, we, that we are facing. I think the risk managers today have to be able to dialogue with IT engineers, uh, security experts who have their own language, their own vocabulary. So you need to be able to cope with that that's really a challenge. You need to overcome this point. It is absolutely mandatory. And also then create a credibility step, recognizing that uh, security and IT specialists are using some of our words. Risk management is a specific wording that is used as well by security. It means completely something different than what we are using as risk management when we mean risk management. I, I realized that um, very concretely when we wrote together with the, the French NC, who are really IT specialists, the state of the art of the, of the security experts. And we, we took a month to realize that we were using the same words, but do not have the same meaning of the word. So in fact, you have two hurdles. First one is understand the vocabulary and don't be afraid about technology. 
without having the ambition to become the expert, but understand that. And two, create effectively this common understanding that they are using some of our words for years with a different meaning, and you need to have a consensus on what will be the way we will be able to have this dialogue together and come on and, and share this understanding. Once we've done that, then you need to convince the IT specialists and the security experts that you are not their enemy. What do I mean by that? Um, it's not because we are there that we, we are showing some uh, deficiencies of their work. Identifying risk exposure doesn't mean that they don't do their security work properly. To the contrary, we are there to support them when talking to the top management. And as Jamie mentioned, be able to highlight the benefit of some investment and some mitigation in the reduction of the overall risk exposure. And that's what we are, we are able to do on our side. So we are their alliés. We are able to support them in this dialogue and also to translate for the top management also the, the message saying that the top management has to, to define what is the, their risk appetite. What are the, 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 the frontiers, the boundaries that the, the and the company is not able to, I mean, is not ready to overcome. And thanks to that, help security to translate that into the security policy, which will be along those priority lines. So that's really what I would say the challenge for the risk managers, my peers, and that's what really I recommend for all of them today to become really a key actor in this overall uh, galaxy. Well, th thank you, Philippe. That, that sounds like um, perhaps a, a future project for Firma and its members. Um, working with their uh, technology partners to perhaps uh, create some of that common language and uh, having worked in a law firm for many years it's all about language or as we said taxonomy uh, and it's very easy to use the same words um, and they have completely different meanings um, and i think it to a degree chanel that this sort of links into the question i wanted to ask you and that is um what what does the ideal cyber insurance look like? Is it something that leans on common wordings? Um, is it um, uh, is there a perfect solution out there that would that would deal with some of the shortcomings um, that we talked about earlier? Well, what's your point of view of what does good look like? The short answer is very big and very profitable, but no. On a on a serious on a serious note, I think we look at some of the big changes in our society and history and how insurance helped shape that, whether it was the start of trade and marine insurance giving confidence for people to export goods or it was investment in property and in earthquake driven countries. I think again with cyber, we have a huge opportunity as the, as the globe moves more digital that cyber insurance can be an enabler to that. So how does it need to look to be that enabler? I think it comes back to to the sharing of data and understanding the exposures. You as risk managers, not being afraid to share with each other what is best practice. And I think the the, the more comfort we can give on on what is good from a, from a cyber engineering or on a on a coverage is is the way to build something sustainable. So I would say something that we can really through data, and it seems obvious that cyber insurance should be driven by data, but through data we can we can really make a difference that the insurance actually improves risk management by incentivizing good best practices, good IT security, and that will then enable us as insurers to provide the capacity that ultimately is needed. Okay, Chanel, thank you. Um, I'm sort of getting a bit of a theme here because we've got um, Philippe talking about um, uh, how the risk manager climbs the cyber curve uh, and Chanel talking about that for insurance um, and Jamie earlier talked about the governance side of things but the one area that we haven't really talked about and I'm going to ask Jamie this question um, is that there are some big IT providers out there um, with logos like big blue logos Jamie what, what role do these big technology providers play in, in the world that we've been discussing? Do they have a role? Um, should we be collaborating more closely with some of these 
organisations. Um, do you have a point of view on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, the big technology providers <coughs> have an interest in increasing our confidence in using their technology. That's how they make money. Um, at the same time, they're obviously very reluctant and have been for decades uh, to accept a kind of liability transfer when, when, as we use uh, that technology. Um, I think that that arrangement is under some stress. I think that the more forward-thinking big tech companies should be and probably are maybe looking at accepting a degree of risk transfer in the same way that the financial sector, I think, is accepting or has, has always accepted a, a degree of risk transfer for fraud <clears throat> and um, increasingly accepting there's some uh, liability even when the fault lies with the end user. So I think that there will be some changes, uh, but I think that business will be uh, kicking and screaming uh, when that happens. However, I don't think that means that companies can entirely, you know, you can't outsource risk entirely, uh, even with insurance, even to your supply chain. Ultimately, the responsibility for risk uh, lies with the end user company. Uh, I'm sort of going to go um, into questions that have come in from the floor and I'm going to do an unusual thing. I'm going to start at the last question that came in because I think this is um, a, a, what I call a blockbuster question. And, and that is, you know, what do you think um, the probability is of, we, we've, we've talked about pandemic being a um, high impact, low probability, whether you think that's a black swan or not, we, we could have another panel on, but uh, let's just call them high impact, low probability risks or systemic risks. Um, what's the probability, do you think, of a global total, total collapse of the IT infrastructure uh, and particularly maybe the internet? We've got lots of people working well at home, um, but they're not going to be working very well at home if they've got nothing to work off. Um, what, what do you think of the probability of a total collapse? Um, and I think that's something I'll probably start with Jamie on. But then, Chanel, how does the insurance industry cope with these major systemic issues? I know they're looking at um, uh, solutions for pandemic, but what about a similar solution for cyber? Do we have cyber re, pandemic re, flood re, terrorism re? Every time we have a, a problem, we'll have another re. Um, but what, what's the insurance industry view on this? So I'm going to start with Jamie. Um, is that going to be a possibility, Jamie? Um, or is it beyond um, uh, contemplating thinking? Um, I, I, I think it, there, there are credible scenarios which include very, very major disruptions to the availability of you know, the underpinning infrastructure if not globally in several parts of the world. And I think this has been known for a long time. We we have had internet blackouts in certain countries, for example, caused by uh, damages to undersea cables. Um, we saw some very major disruption to multiple organizations when one of the domain name service providers was uh, impacted by the Mirai botnet a, a, a few years ago. And we have seen individual uh, malware strains such as NotPetya and WannaCry kind of spread rapidly and seemingly uncontrollably. Um, I think there are issues such as risks to the systemic confidence that we have in cryptography arising from some of the advancements in quantum computing. For example, that's rather a, a technical example. But if that's not gripped and we don't have the right 
uh, quantum agile cryptography, as it's called, then that could cause a, a major collapse in confidence in some of the uh, infrastructure. So I think despite the fact that the internet originally was designed to be highly um, resilient to, in that case, uh, nuclear attack, the the way that we've had a small number of players reach huge market dominance does create the kinds of single points of failure that means that a, if not a global total collapse, then a very, very significant uh, disruption is, is definitely a credible scenario, yes, to answer your question. Thank you, Jamie. And, and turning to Chanel, um, insurance industry up to coping with this, um, or do we need something different in the background for that type of eventuality? Good question, and it's something we, Julia, we do think about a lot. I have a number of meetings on this topic all the time where we run what we call realistic disaster scenarios. So we would look at what could cause some of those type of things that Jamie talked about. And yes, when non petcher was estimated at around about 10 million, although only around 3 billion insured, you can think of state sponsored war, um, cyber events, and obviously software glitches on, on, on widely used software or even a, a one of the global cloud providers. So we do look at it. Is the industry prepared? Controversially, I would say maybe at the moment it's not far off because at least on the cyber insurance side, it's not the biggest insurance uh, purchase at the moment, but we all know this is now accelerating and will accelerate. So I absolutely think we must explore once we once we model some of these scenarios as an industry some of the things you talked about there's only so much as we've seen in the pandemic that insurance and reinsurance might be able to handle there's certainly governmental and regulatory incentive to make sure that financial impact is is minimized so whether it's a pool or a a, a collective reinsurance scheme i think these are some of the things again we must think about um, Proactively. Thank you, Chanel. And, and I'm going to turn to Philippe, um, not, not to uh, solve the problems of the world, Philippe, but do you think um, uh, the governments and the insurance industry ought to be getting together maybe to fund more research in this space? And is this something that you as a risk professional would welcome and be happy to take part in? So I, I'm very disappointed, Juliet. So we cannot save the world. Or, I mean, I cannot save the world, but uh, I, I cope with it. Um, I can only concur with your proposal. And, and effectively, one private company alone can, is not in a situation to be able to, to, to address that. But clearly, um, I think if we are collectively able to address this uh, threat to the economy and to sovereignty, which are currently the two topics which are really at stake. And uh, we are more than welcome to, to collaborate to this project in order to support that and to provide a more resilient solution for everyone. I think that it's really in the interest of all the parties to collaborate into this, this project. And, and, and I guess one of the challenges in the world is that we don't have a terribly good track record of collaborating with each other. So, so I guess some sort of platform where people can come together is, is perhaps something um, FIRMA can take forward as a collective of the associations um, that you represent with, our, with, with your partners and those of others who are on the call today. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit closer to ground uh, for a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, Philippe, I'm not going to ask you to save the world on this one. So you can you can put the outfit away for uh, uh, whichever saviour of the world you you uh, prefer. Um, and this one, I think, is um, probably directed at uh, Chanel. So, um, do you think that the stretching of capacity and coverage from insurers is linked to the low prices? together with the reluctance, um, and again, it sort of links into the previous question, but there does seem to be a reluctance across insurers and the rest of the industry to share information. Um, so do you think that sort of stretching of capacity with coverage and, and the 
maybe the reluctance of insurers to share information is one of the challenges that the cyber insurance industry yes so first can we as insurers look back and think we could have done things better yes i think you know there there was certainly a, a growth um push in cyber insurance i think to to defend the industry obviously and i come back again to the availability of risk information and data you know through those first years it was very hard as an as an underwriter should do assess both the individual risk of of a particular company and also as we just spoke about the risk uh, on an aggregated basis. So I think there is some of that recalibrating now as we see the exposure and the claims developing. But I think, it, it, again, it comes back to this topic. If we can, if we can see more data on a, on a more regular basis, that is going to definitely help the accuracy of that pricing, the stability of that capacity. Um, so the, again, I, yeah, I would come back to the sharing of information, whether it's from big data and to add to Jamie's point earlier, we, we do talk to some of those big companies. It's a fine line between, you know, understanding how we can link the use of, of very good best practice software with acceptable insurance terms and potentially even sharing data. There, of course, as we know, data sharing is a, is a very complex legal and compliance issue. But again, I think they also play a part in that data sharing to make sure that we have a and we're all in a very hard market at the moment on all lines of business that we have a more uh, consistent and smooth offering and capacity thank you chanel and, and i'm going to bring philippe in on that question as well philippe do you do you have anything to add on that one <clears throat> yeah yes uh, julia because um i think at Ferma we were probably among the the, the very proactive organization who, who realized from the start that the question of the dialogue and the quality of the dialogue between insured and insurers was really uh, absolutely uh, fundamental. And that's what we we worked and uh, Julia, you were kind of to participate to that effort when we issued this, this document preparing for cyber insurance, which aimed to try to close the gap between insured and insurers regarding um, what are the key elements that are uh, of value for the insurers so that uh, the insured understands better the question and be able to provide the valuable answers to that. But also uh, on the insurer side, try to explain uh, to them better what is the different offers that they can provide to the insured so that the quality of the, of the insurance offer is better appreciated by the insured. So, we have been really uh, proactive in that because we thought from the start that it's really a key issue. Another point, which again, uh, regarding capacity, I think for years, and, and I still believe under the control of, of Chanel, that capacity may not be the right question. I see many companies and many of my peers who had uh, over the last uh, years, uh, really uh, um, an approach which was more budget driven than exposure driven. In other words, that they were buying uh, cyber insurance to the level of their budget more than to the level of their needs. Today, what really the message we need to have is, is that we need to have a better assessment of cyber exposure and be prepared to have a dialogue where effectively we're gonna need to, to, to address and, uh, uh, and buy the capacity required and not just the, the one that, that is afforded through a previous budget. And that's under that circumstance that I think today, the capacity offered by the market, insurance market is sufficient to address the needs, the, the request, but I'm not sure that it is sufficient to address the needs. And that's really the concern. So, to, but to do that, we need to make sure that the companies are ready to close the gap and be ready to, to have a, an assessment, a true assessment of their exposure and be ready to uh, challenge the market with such a request. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm mindful that the topic for today is cyber as part of enterprise risk management. So I'm going to come back to the panel with one final question. And I'm going to ask each of you to give your view on that final question. Um, and of course, when you go round a panel, it gets harder for the second 
and harder for the third person. So just have a think about what you want to say. And I'm going to start off with Jamie. Um, and my question to you um, to end this is if there's one thing you to organisations to help improve cyber resilience and risk management, I'm going to ask each of the members of the panel, what would that one thing be that you would recommend as top of your list? So I'm going to start with Jamie, then go to Chanel, and then go to Philippe. Thanks, Julia. One thing, goodness. Um, it, it sounds so obvious, but I think getting a grip on what your actual exposure is, because I've spoken to a lot of companies. I do a lot of consulting, as you know, Julia. I've yet to find a company that has really mapped out what its actual exposure to cyber risk is. And I think to do that, yes, the, the chief information security officer, if you've got one, has got a role. The risk officer, and if you have one, a chief a technology risk officer have a role to play. But if it doesn't involve the front line of the business, then you're not going to get a true picture. So I think an exercise to really nail down what is that exposure is the single most important thing for companies to do. And that needs to be a very pervasive, inclusive process. Thank you, Jamie. And um, Chanel, I'll, I'll come to you with, this, with the same question. What What would be your top piece of advice that we can have as a takeaway today? Openness, and I use the word openness because I think what Jamie said was obviously critical. It is that establishing that risk quantification um, to understand the exposure and then buy appropriate solutions. But I think given cyber is such a global risk and the, the challenges faced by all of you as companies are global and there will be such similarity in some of those threats and then how your vulnerabilities potentially are susceptible to those threats. I think being open, whether that's best practice sharing, whether that's a firmer forum, whether that's working with us on on a dialogue with engineers, I think, again, this is something we really can have a big collective benefit from. Chanel, and, and finally, Um, yeah, so on, on my side, and, and, and of course, as I'm the last one, it's probably more difficult for me then. Um, if I have only one message is that we need to convince everybody that cyber risk management will be a key contributor to the value of the company. And if this message pass, then all the different uh, sets about organization, about alignment, about governance, about uh, dialogue between IT, security, business, and risk managers, all that will, will be easier to, to, to implement as long as there is a consensus that for the value of the company, cyber risk management is a key contributor. Thank you very much indeed, um, Philippe. So I'm going to uh, move to um, make some final comments um and uh i'd like to if we can get the slides back up on the screen and uh no okay not to worry um i'm going to make um, some final concluding remarks thank thank you very much for putting that back um so uh my points on this uh and takeaways um there's no going back um we may like the status quo and we may like comfort but when you think about the work from the firma 2020 uh, report from the mckinsey report and from everything our panel has said today we are clearly moving forward at high velocity and there's no going back to the world that we perhaps were more comfortable with um, change has happened and we have to adjust the way that we deal with that change and equip ourselves for the future um, I like the comment that was made, I think, by Chanel that said we've gone from emerging risk to the risk. So uh, cyber isn't an emerging risk anymore. It's something we can see and touch. But it does have the characteristics of an emerging risk, because as we heard today, um, you may know it's there. But like all risks, 
um, emerging and otherwise. It can change shape and it can change direction and it can change speed. So it's incredibly unpredictable. And I think, you know, we don't mix up emerging risk with something that's just new. Emerging risks can be risks that you know about. They're just very unpredictable a bit like a pandemic. Um, many companies have pandemic in their risk register. What took people by surprise was the type of pandemic, the strength of that pandemic in terms of geographic spread and the speed of which it spread. And in many ways, cyber pandemic um, is perhaps um, a, an un unfortunate, but nevertheless relevant um, and fair analogy. Um, we need to work together um, to deal with these issues. Nothing works in a vacuum. Uh, quite a lot of what our panel were talking about today clearly require collaboration, whether that's a common language for risk management or a common language for insurance. Um, but we cannot achieve things in isolation, either as risk professionals, insurers, brokers, academics, either within Europe, even within countries within Europe, but this, in many ways, demands um, some global responses. And therefore, um, we need to work together and we need to um, collaborate together. But of course, one of the things uh, that was mentioned also is that working together isn't all about prevention. It's also about converting opportunity. And I heard quite a lot of things in today's panel that talked about the benefits of collaboration and the benefits of working together to release opportunity, not just to prevent things. And then finally, we, we talked about um, the issues that we would like um, to see as our sort of top uh, items for uh, building cyber resilience. And that again is about risk quantification. It, 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 I agree with Jamie, it sounds obvious, but it's amazing the number of organizations that probably don't do this. And you have to collaborate and do all those other things that the panel were talking about today um, to achieve that and have openness. Um, and I know, Chanel, you, you made that point of openness, which is incredibly important. Um, and um, again, a very important thing to say. And then finally, and importantly with Philippe, our, our risk professional uh, on this panel, bringing all of that together to build resilience for the future. Uh, and perhaps a position and a role that firma can play in developing that future. So I'd like to uh, close by thanking our panel today. I think you've done a fantastic job. Um, you've answered every question that we um, have been able to throw at you. Um, very importantly, I would like to ask a very resilient um, number of people who've been on this uh, workshop this afternoon. Uh, we've lost very few people along the way. Uh, thank you for staying with us. Thank you especially for um, feeding some suitably challenging questions to our panel. You certainly didn't let them off the hook easily. A great list of questions. So we really do appreciate your engagement. These workshops are only as good as the dialogue that we can create. So thank you very much indeed for the dialogue that you have stimulated today. Um, I had too many questions to be able to pose all of them to the panel. So please forgive me for the, for the number of uh, delegates today that we couldn't pose all of the questions for. It's not that your questions weren't good questions. We just had rather too many, which is a great thing to have when you have a workshop like this. So thank you very much uh, for fueling um, a very lively discussion. And thank you very much for Firma and everyone behind the scenes uh, for making this workshop possible. And on that point, uh, a thank you again to our panel of uh, Philippe, Chanel and uh, Jamie. I hope everyone um, has a great day and we look forward to keeping in touch with you in the future. Thank you. Last reminder, the closing will take place in the plenary and in the auditorium in a few minutes. Thank you for following us and see you soon.